Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome, everybody, to the Into the Impossible podcast, a production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego. I am your fearful host, Brian Keating, co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Today's a very special episode for me. Not only do I get to interview uh, one of my uh, colleagues in my field of cosmology, but the very person who inspired me to write my own book, Losing the Nobel Prize, a story of cosmology, ambition, and the perils of science's highest honor. Uh, and that's Stefan Alexander. And he, uh, more than any person really, uh, is credited in some way, or maybe blamed, uh, for encouraging me to write this book. And uh, I want to read from the acknowledgments of my book, where I refer to him and the deep impact he had on my life. I say, this book owes its existence to my brother from another mother, Stefan Alexander. Nothing has changed between us since those late night intellectual jam sessions spent together as Nobel hopefuls at Brown University 25 years ago. Then, as now, Stefan's encouragement and wisdom kept me going through the darkness. Thank you for believing that mine was a story that needed to be told. And I've known Stefan since we were both beginning graduate students at Brown University, where he now teaches. And Stefan is actually also, in addition to his teaching and theoretical and contributions and research, he is the president of the National Society of Black Physicists, a member uh, for many decades, and now he leads that organization. I'm proud to say that I'm also an honorary member of that august organization. And I hope that my listeners out there will take this opportunity to uh, visit nsbp.org. And uh, perhaps if the spirit moves you, make a donation in honor of the many contributions to our knowledge of the universe that these incredible minds have made. Uh, today's episode is very special because, as I said, it's with one of my friends, and how often do you get to interview your friends? Uh, we're going to talk a lot about Stefan's book, The Jazz of Physics. Subtitle is The Secret Link Between Music and the Structure of the Universe. This copy, if you're watching the video, uh, is actually the first copy that he ever got, and I was with him in New York in uh, early 2016, right before it came out. It's the fourth anniversary. And the dedication still moves me. It says, uh, he wrote to me, to my best friend, Brian, 23 years after that cold night with the sacks at the bridge, we have arrived. Looking forward to your book. And this is before I even thought about writing a book. So Stefan uh, is a tremendous influence on me and my life. And this has uh, really been uh, just such a pleasure to watch as he's influenced the careers of many generations of physicists and will continue to do so as the president of the National Society of Black Physicists. So I encourage everybody to get this book. Uh, you'll stay tuned, you'll hear some, uh, some call outs to his upcoming work. And uh, I urge you to tune in and see all the great stuff that Stefan is doing. Uh, now, please enjoy this episode featuring Professor Stefan Alexander. Uh, welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Into the Impossible podcast, a production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UCSD. I'm your fearful host during these pandemic podcasts. My name is Brian Keating. I'm the Associate Director of the Clarke Center. And uh, all the podcasts that I've done, I think I've done about 20 by now since the pandemic started to take over the planet back in, in March. And uh, of all of those podcasts, I have to say that this is the one Perhaps I've been looking forward to the most simply because the guest today is uh, none other than my uh, than my best buddy, uh, Stefan Alexander, who uh, who has uh, really been a fixture in my life for what I don't want to say. It's probably uh, close to three decades now, but let, let's not get into how old we each are. He is older than me. He is older than me by a couple of months. He's uh, wiser, okay. wiser than me too. Um, All of them. So, <laughs> so I want to introduce Stefan Alexander, Professor Stefan Alexander, who is professor of physics at Brown University. Stefan, a welcome to the Into the Impossible podcast. Well, Brian, um, I um, I remain flattened as flat as flat earth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Flatter <laughs> than flatter I, earth. I, I never thought. I never. I would never imagine. Like you know. You know, many decades ago, um, me going on that dangerous fir um, airplane flight with you when you were learning how to fly. <laughs> uh, today would come where you you would be interviewing me on a podcast. 
<laughs> so yeah, is- I know. It's, it would be uh, quite crazy to think of either one and, and for us both to be professors, uh, although I, I, I had high hopes for you. I wasn't so sure about myself. But, um, but it's really a treat to have on uh, such a good friend on this podcast. And I also want to thank you uh, and express gratitude for connecting me to so many brilliant minds as you have that have been guests on the podcast and looking forward to, uh, to many more. And the other thing I want to thank you for is, uh, is inspiring me to write my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, which uh, above my different shoulders here are various uh, pictures of the cover, the audiobook, and the regular book. And in that, in the acknowledgement section, you were the person that I thank first. So I I don't thank my mother for having me uh, until later, uh, but I thank you because you really not only convinced me that I had a story worthy of telling, but you showed the way forward in your book, uh, The Jazz of Physics, which we're going to get into on the anniversary of its uh, fourth anniversary of its publication. I cannot believe that time has flown by and it has been four years. Can you believe, uh, what is it, how does it feel? Does it feel like it just came out yesterday? It literally, it does feel like it came out well, two days ago. Um, it, but, but yeah, and then, they, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, when, when I think about like good friendships throughout my lifetime, it's those that, that have organically been that of like, you know, I, I think this sort of, this, this sort of like, you know, yeah, you have a lot, you have things to be grateful, but I also have things, very um, 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 powerful things to be grateful of, uh, to you of, you know. So it, it goes both ways. So maybe one day if I, if I chance on a podcast, I'll, I'll also um, spell, <laughs> spell out what those things are, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe when your next performance at uh, Jazz at Carnegie yeah. uh, Lincoln Center. I, I, definitely, I definitely am thankful for that, t- that Tisset watch I got for the, you know, oh, being, yeah. for being in the wedding, right? That, that's that was, right. right? My, one of my best men but, at, at my wedding. That's right. Absolutely. I cannot believe that's been almost 12 years ago. Well, I'm sitting here enjoying and every time, I gave you that watch because I wanted you to, every time you look at it, to think of how much you mean to me and how much hopefully I've come to mean to you in the decade uh, and uh, and plus since I got married and gave you that gift for your service as as the honor guard at my wedding. Uh, But every time I have a cup of this substance here, which is not vodka for a change, it is uh, simply coffee, I, uh, I think about you because you were the first person to introduce me to coffee, as we call it, we New Yorkers. Uh, you remember our uh, Ocean's Coffee Roasters, right? Oh, yeah, man. That's, uh, that, that, that was a fixture for us in grad you school. Took a, you took me there. You got me hooked on coffee. And I'll, I'll never really contemplate seeing you without a cup of coffee not too uh, far away from you. And that's not surprising because, as uh, the mathematician uh, Paul Erdos said, that a mathematician is a machine to convert coffee into equations. And you are a theoretical physicist uh, with a specialization in early universe cosmology. And you and I both uh, studied together on the different poles of experiment and theory way back, beginning in 1993 at Brown University. And uh, oh, oh. Yeah, and I want to take us back to those uh, to those heady days in the early part of the or the late part of the previous millennium. I, it mm-hmm. makes us sound really old when we talk like that. Uh, but I want to talk about um, how our careers have kind of been mirror images of one another. You pursuing uh, uh, theoretical pursuits in cosmology and mine and experimental, but kind of loosely coupled like Cooper pairs uh, across the, uh, the Brillouin sphere or something like that. Uh, mm-hmm. None other than Leon Cooper, your colleague, our former professor at, uh, at Brown university. Who is he still, is he emeritus now? What is Leon's uh, status? Emeritus, his mind is sharp, is still sharp as heck. Does not surprise uh, me. You know, obviously I have Cooper stories for days. <laughs> There's a Cooper story in chapter three of the book, of course. But, uh, <laughs> That's right. He never, he never fails to, you know, to just like, you know, throw me off guard, right? Uh, that's what he's good at. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll never forget. Um, we were taking his advanced quantum mechanics. I don't know if you remember this, but. I was in that class, of course. You were was- with me, yeah. We were in that class. I barely could handle regular quantum mechanics, and here he was. And um, I remember him saying, so I asked a question, and he's like, well, you obviously didn't pay attention in your undergraduate quantum mechanics class. And I was half tempted to say, well, I learned undergraduate quantum mechanics from your book. But I didn't say it. I didn't have the, um, oh, oh, the curve. Can you imagine that? I don't even think Leon would have, he would have smacked me upside the head. That with other quantum professors, and I won't name names. No, no, no. We're not going to go there. 
<laughs> right. No, no, we're not going to go there. Um, the audience knows who Leon Cooper is, right? I mean, yeah, tell us about him. Tell us about him. What does he mean? What does he mean to physics? Um, well, you know, there's a, you know, almost 50 year old problem called superconductivity that was actually, right, experimental. It's in 1911. I can't, Omnis, I guess I, I pronounced the name. Cameron Lynn Omnis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Discovered experimentally that metals, you know, um, will, you know, conduct with zero resistance. And there was no explanation for it theoretically. And everybody worked on it, including Einstein, Feynman, Landau, you name it. Schrodinger, Heisenberg, um, and a very young guy named Leon Cooper. And the important thing about Leon was he was an outsider. So he was trained as a particle physicist, you know, a, you know, a New Yorker like us. Yeah. And um, Bardeen took him out to, to Illinois. And Bardeen actually literally wanted, um, you know, somebody that was not a condensed matter person to work on the problem because he felt that they would have fresh eyes and an outsider's perspective. And it proved to be correct. Um, and, you know, I, um, the important thing about Leon is he is, um, I mean, the, the, you know, he basically took that, what, 17 hour train ride from Illinois back to New York and decided to just, he tried all these calculations and say, you know what, I'm just going to like see the problem as a physics problem and just like throw away the math and just like, you know, just do some dirty physics, use my intuition. And he cracked the code. He solved super, con you know, he came up with a key idea which is that fermions can pair up to, to act as a quasi, kind of, you know, basically effectively act as a spin zero particle um, that enabled this collective effect such that it, that collective effect of the spin zero particle could conduct um, without any um, resistance. And it led to some predictions and uh, it earned him a Nobel Prize. And one of the things Leon always used to tell me whenever I, I he would make me feel stupid, he said, um, you know, Einstein once told me, I was like, okay, he goes, <laughs> that um, if, if we knew what we were talking about, we wouldn't call it research. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, that was one of his chestnuts. Yeah, and like one, one, one other interesting, I think very powerful Leon Cooper story, I think that really kind of, um, in, kind of is, is my lantern, all right, for how I do things and how I do everything in my, in my work. Um, including my mentor and of students. One time after 15 years, I, I figured that, you know, that I was going to come back and like impress him, you know, like I'd already been a, a young professor. I just gotten tenure. I got this fancy, you know, APS award and all this, whatever. Right. Um, and I drive back and Leon is there. He's just about to retire. I go in his office and I start getting a blackboard. And I, mm -hmm. at this point I figured that I knew all this, like all this math and all this stuff so I'm sitting there. And by the time I'd, I'd written this paper with, with, with Michael Peskin, that was like a PRL and it was like a big thing for us. And I write this thing and he goes, you know, Stefan, you just slow down. I mean, you know, I think I'm a pretty smart guy, but you just got to slow down. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, wow. You know, it's like he set me up for the sucker punch. I'm like, oh, wow. Like Leon is like, you know, I'm, I'm going too fast to the master. So then he goes, and you know, why don't you find a real problem and like work on it? Find, find yourself a real problem, like a hard problem, like a real physics problem, and like dedicate yourself and work on it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I've, I, you know, it was like the death blow of those Kung Fu movies. Like <laughs> only three days later, you start like, you know, having internal bleeding and like, so I was just like Whoa. <laughs> yeah, like I've been wasting 15 years of my time, like, you know, chasing whatever, you know, ch uh, chasing, the, you know, chasing the, the company basically, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, yeah. I, I, identify my problem like you know and actually i thought about you because you had been you as an experimentalist i call you a, you know a theoretical experimentalist <laughs> um had been had been chasing that right you had been mm -hmm. doing that for decades yeah i think i was talking about this with jan 11 who you connected me with uh, on the podcast recently and i said you know physicists uh sort of have to cultivate a brand like what their tastes are and i think you exemplify that um, as well as, and I hope we can get into this as well, um, not just within the research domain where you're, you know, eminently, you know, successful in your research program of coming up with a brand 
the Alexander brand, which has a characteristic style, which is different, you know, than someone like Jana who will write, you know, very- on Fordham Road, Alexander's. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, but on the same token, having, you know, having a very disciplined approach to, to research, but also being able to communicate ideas to a lay audience. And, uh, and I think exemplified in, in this book, how, you really have an ability, which, which I, you know, as I discussed with her, there aren't so many people like her, like you, who can both communicate to, to the layperson, but also can, uh, can do cutting edge research. And there are people like our, our friend Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's, you know, an amazing communicator, you know, very polished, uh, you know, he's, uh, yeah. he's, he's uh, phenomenal at what he does, uh, but he's not doing cutting edge scientific research. And he's the first to admit it, which, which is one of the things that endears me, endears him to me so much because he will be, you know, the first to say, well, there's a big discovery of a black hole event horizon, you know, and the media will want to talk to him and he'll say, no, go talk to the team that did it. Go talk to the real scientist. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I have great respect for that, but how do you straddle and how do you manage that? And, and is it, is it, you know, what's your workflow like to go, can you slip in and out of these two different, um, very highly creative modalities of thought one i think you would agree right that theoretical physics is incredibly creative and so is jazz music and improvisation and also writing so take us through those three different um you know kind of uh, uh, tripartite aspects of your of your nature well i'm gonna be i'll I'll, I'll probably be the first this will probably be the first time i admit this on any podcast i've done a few since writing my book and um, exclusive exclusive uh, to the into the impossible podcast yeah so i would say like internally i don't i don't actually feel that like you know when we think about the classic being smart like you know this person can you know accumulate information or you know can can master these technical things or i've always felt like and like i i don't feel smart in that way right and what I've managed to do, I think my hack is I've managed to um, engage in things that I'm naturally, I would say I'm naturally attuned to, um, attracted to, and figured out a way to weave them into each other in a way that if you cut one of those, one of those links, they all fall apart. So for, for example, you know, you, um, you know that I, you know, I, I, I used to, I was a serious runner and yeah. I, until, until I, you know, I'm, 400 meters, right? Until I turned 49. <laughs> but, you know, until, now it's 399 meters. That's right. You know, 400 and 800 and cross country. And like, so I was really into that, but a lot of times I found that my runs were, were, was exactly that place going on that hour long run where I can really get deep into a problem and just like be, um, not have the the um the self-editing that would come out of just if you're sitting at a desk right because you're running you're not going to be editing yourself too much right you got to not worry about not slipping on ice um and or like you know my music right so and then my my physics they're all they're kind of like one activity lends itself to the other such that if i stop one i will feel it with i you know i will see a negative effect with the others so I've kind of come up with a system for myself where I'm the kind of like, you know, jack of those trades. And really, I don't feel like I'm a master of any of those, right? Um, and, and, and those three things, they cycle between each other. There are days where I'll probably play practice more. These days I'm practicing more. Um, my saxophone and, you know, studying my music. And some days I'll be thinking more about a physics problem. Other days I might be, I might be writing. But they're usually all integrated with each other. And if like you cut one of those things off, the others will suffer. So that's a balance between those two, but it, it takes, um, I mean, how I always see it and I've heard it written that the human brain is actually not as good as we think about multitasking. And, you know, especially when things are very disparate, like, you know, it's one thing to be writing an email or something and then, you know, turn your attention to writing a LaTeX, you know, code for a paper. Uh, yeah. But it's another thing to be, you know, practicing, you know, sh- I don't know what you guys do in jazz musicians, but you must do scales or something like that. And then go and sit down and write down, you know, a you know, two dimensional Ising model, you know, expansion as applied to some, you know, very uh, intricate calculation in, in theoretical physics. Uh, can you do that? Or is it more like, well, one day I'll spend time on writing and 
Uh, and the other time I'll, you know, and then a day later or some other half of the day, I'll do, you know, jazz or do uh, hardcore physics. How, how do you approach it? Is it separated in time or space or both? Yeah, they're separated in time and I don't multitask. Um, I, I'm unlike um, our friend Jim Gates, he claims to be a really good multitasker. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm horrible at that. Um, I'm very bad at unitasking. I mean, I go to, to, to working on one thing. Um, but, um, but I guess, let me, let's see. Um, so I think one of the things that I found happening is that I'll be working up, thinking about a physics problem. Actually, I'll be thinking about, thinking about a problem. I'll be thinking about like what kind of problem is worthy pursuing or are there problems to work on, right? So sometimes it'll be as simple as like, what should we be working on? Should I be working on, you know, what's not already been done? What are the low hanging fruits, right? Just a strategy of even finding a problem. You know, um, I, I actually want to turn that question back to you uh, when I'm done saying what I have to say. And sometimes, and sometimes, you know, like, I'm a, I, I hate to admit this, but I'm an impatient person. Mm. And because I'm impatient, what ends up happening is I get very frustrated and then I, I stifle my own creative and even technical, um, you know, abilities. So a simple act of going off and doing something else that is com that might, uh, might be apparent, appear to be orthogonal to that mode, right? So if I go play my sax and I just like work on a scale or work on, you know, a cadence or whatever, a, a tune or what have you, right? Um, long, blown, blown long tones and facing the wall with the saxophone and just blown a long note for like as long as you can and just repeating that for over and over again. There's something about doing that, about kind of vacillating between those things that kind of, I don't know, like contributes. I don't know what the, the right mm -hmm. word is, but I, I don't claim, I don't, I don't want to claim that there's a flash of genius or insight, but somehow like at least it gives me a little bit more energy or, you know, uh, um, my patient tank fills up a little bit more. So I'm able to go back to that problem or go back to that confusion and look at it with fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so for me, it's important to have these other hobbies or things that I do that appear to be orthogonal to, to, you know, to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that um, to be also the case for some other friends. I mean, you're a pilot. So I was wondering if like a similar thing happens for you. Mm. Yeah, I think there's different aspects of it where you can hope to enter into what your colleague at Brown University, Judd Brewer, who's a addiction psychologist and a psychiatrist, uh, MD, PhD, uh, and he talks about this flow state and how people have gotten into it. And obviously, it's, 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 a, it's a state of extreme pleasure once one is inside of such a state. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how, you know, you can kind of pre-game uh, the brain to be receptive to do so to in order to do practical things. So it's, you know, creativity of a physics equation that describes, you know, 10 dimensional space time might not have very many applications in the real world of any. But, uh, but if you're struggling with, you know, smoking addiction, uh, he will then recommend to you this exploration of the curious mind, this, the state of flow that is sort of in, engaged by the parallel trait of curiosity, which is, you know, as far as we know, the way that we express creative curiosity is unique um, on, uh, among species. And, uh, and I think it's so too, is it, you know, possible to get into a flow state where you are, you know, kind of concentrating and time is slipping by and you're not noticing it. Yeah, so for me, flying a plane, that could do it because you have to concentrate so strongly and intently <laughs> okay. on that task. Yeah, except when I flew you over, you know, Rhode Island Sound uh, back way back when and we had some, uh, we had some interesting, interesting experiences, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I want to, you know, kind of take this the next step, which is, you know, on the Arthur C. Clarke Center's, you know, podcast, uh, Into the Impossible, we like to talk about, well, how can you actually train the mind, train for curiosity, and stimulate the mind to do these things? And is it possible, or is it really fundamentally different, the type of creativity that you have, 
as a saxophonist versus the creativity that you have as a, as a jazz musician. Obviously, the jazz of physics makes a case that there mm-hmm. are commonalities between the two. But mm-hmm. let's take it a step further. Are, you know, is there a commonality with experimental physics? Um, you know, is, it, is it the Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance? Or is there something endemic to the art of experimental science um, you know, versus theoretical science? It's just different that, no, it's not possible to get the same kind of flow state or whatever as an experimentalist as a theorist would explore. Yeah, I disagree with that. I think, I, I think my experience um, trying to be an experimentalist and I failed at it. Um, um, it was more experimental biophysics, x-ray crystallography. Remember when I had that medal yeah, yeah. at Harvard? Um, and one of the things I saw was sort of like the, there's, there's theoretical work also going on in this, because you have to now cleverly, um, remember there was this one guy um, in our class, um, he didn't stay around long, but he once said, an exper- a great experimentalist is able to tease out nature's secret. <laughs> able to fool yeah, yeah. To reveal in her secrets, right? Yeah. Like this idea that like, you know, there are these hidden things and how do you des- design a magic trick, right? Yeah. That's kind of like a really brilliant experiment is that you, you, you have to now imagine and theorize before you even get on and, and build this, the breadboard, right? There's this kind of like theorizing and figuring out, okay, how do I fool nature, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And how do, I, how do I rewire nature to reveal, mm. to reveal um, the unseen, right. um, make it manifest? So I think that there is a very similar, um, it's, I think it's coming from the same source, Really, really brilliant experiments. Um, I, and I would love to see you write, a, your, your second book should be about that, should be about the genius of like, like, you know, we often talk about the genius of how F- Feynman took the rock's um, amplitude and turned it into the Feynman path in the world. Like, you know, let's talk about the genius of like the pound replica experiment and like these designs that, mm. that like made theory real, you know? I yeah. mean, like when the, I remember like when we were grad students, you go down in the basement with my coffee, you're working on this very expensive amplifier. <laughs> and I'm like, you're building an amplifier to look for polarization in the CMB. Like, that's a pipe dream. Like, <laughs> 1994, right? 1993 or something. Yeah, that's right. Well, like, you weren't I'm, alone. No, none other than uh, Paul Steinhardt said we'd never detect it. So <laughs> well, maybe he's right about B modes. I, I don't know. I remember right. he gave a colloquium when we were, uh, you know, first year students. Second year. It's like, why are you Brother wasting Paul. your time with this? <laughs> <laughs> we love him for that. Yeah, we do. We do. And, and I want to get into some of the kind of creative aspects of things that he explores and you explore. Because I, I think he's you know, wrong. Be, <laughs> but, <laughs> I want to uh, talk about, you know, kind of the difference oh, between wow. between our um, two fields, you know, of experiment and theory that uh, that there isn't necessarily consilience between them because. Uh, you couldn't make a good living as a theorist, you know, predicting things. Uh, you know, I was talking to Jana again uh, you know, earlier, and you know, thank you for stopping by the podcast. We had a crossover episode, which we'll uh, put a link to, where you know it's like facts of life and different strokes all got together. But uh, remember that back in the day, what's happening? And you know, uh, we used to watch all those shows together, and now uh, we had a crossover. So thank you for joining that. But you know, we talked about like her you theories have, uh, have a rerun of the episode yeah, you want to be rerun oh no roger uh that's a roger i'll say that uh the uh the thing that we talked about was like her theories you know of a black hole battery black hole flashlights and uh you know topology on the universe on these massive scales that you know really you could never expect to test in fact her previous book or her re- you know most recent book she's writing another one that'll be out later this year but about the detection well, yeah, she's writing another book about black holes and and how but the first book, you know, about, you know, the Black Hole Blues book was really brought to fruition as a success only because of the discovery by an experimental team. And one of the things I like to talk about with mostly I've had on theoretical physicists like Jim Gates and Sean Carroll and um Katie Mack and others that were on, but when I talk to a theoretician, I always like to get a sense of what they view as the value of experiment. In other words, is experiment merely, you know, the kind of con- confirmatory or, ref- you know, refuting evidence for a theory? In other words, does experiment serve theory or, or is there another road? Is there a different ground that uh, is intrinsically valuable? Because obviously, you know, you and I have great regard for, for the ancients and Galileo, 
you know, he didn't, they didn't make a distinction between a theoretical physicist and experimental physicist until what the 1920s or something like that. So, yeah. um, so what do you make of that? Is, is experiment in the service of theory, not in a negative sense, but is it in used only in service to kind of prove or, or, you know, kind of validate physical laws of nature that are produced by theorists? Um, yeah, so my, I, I've, had a, I've had an evolution with regards to this. If you had asked me this question 10 years ago, I'd be like, well, I'm living in 10 dimensions and I'm trying to deal with pure thought and trying to use, I'm trying to find a ground state of string theory that will correspond to our universe, which was something that I was working on. Um, and then, I, you know, well, you know that story. And I, you know, I, I managed to, to do something with that. And then it turned out that, that it all went to, um, it all fell into the multiverse. Um, but, so I, um, there are two things that changed my direction. Um, one was a statement from B.J. Bjorken, um, the great particle physicist, who at some point, like, you know, he's responsible for the quark model of, you know, and there's some particles named after him. And he is a, a, a theorist of the highest order and, and one of the great theorists of, our, of the last century, um, theoretical particle physicist particle physicist. And when I was at Slack as a postdoc, he would always come around and like, you know, ask us trick trivia questions. And one question he would ask us was, because, you know, a lot of the theorists got attracted to theory because of Einstein and, mm -hmm. and this idea that he came up with GR on pure thought. So BJ asked the question was like, how long after Einstein discovered GR, did he apply his theory to the perihelion of Mercury? All right. Now, my memory not, may not serve me, but it's an order of a few days. All mm -hmm. right. And a lot of us were shocked at that. Right. So in other words, Einstein had already known about certain experimental facts that were problematic that mm. he used to guide him towards his theory. Mm. But it goes deeper than that. My evolution is actually that, you know, these days I rely on talking to experimentalists to help my theoretical intuition. Mm. All right. So I actually I engage in theoretical talk with experimentalists. Because I, 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 so, um, and I think the, the, the big, the, for me, the big story mm -hmm. in the history of theoretical physics mm -hmm. is something called quantum field theory, which is we, many people believe to be the mother language of, you know, the standard model is based on this language on quantum field theory and the idea of the field, right? Now, mm -hmm. you know, in the 1800s, a guy named Michael Faraday, you know, as you know, the story, he, He's probably the greatest experimentalist known in, in, our, in, in physics. Um, and Faraday, to explain why it is that change in magnetic fields will induce electric currents far away from the magnet, um, said there's going to be, he theorized that there were invisible lines of force, you know, like woo-woo stuff, right? And he was the laughing stock of the theorists. And right. that turned out to be actually the paradigm of physics, which is, the idea of, that everything basically are made up of fields. Mm -hmm. and it came from an experimentalist. It came from the intuition of an experimentalist. Um, so again, I think that, you know, for me personally, I, you know, I was watching, a, I'll give you a good example. There was a conference that I saw that you were a part of at the Perimeter Institute. You were one of two experimentalists at this conference. It was like all about like, you know, you know, the, the past hypothesis and the empty, you know, the smallest of entropy in the universe and, the, the arrow of time and, you know, and everyone was saying all this stuff, all this fancy ABS, CFT and C and you know, all this stuff. And, and you actually, I was watching this, you rose your hand and you said, you know, <laughs> you know we're looking for um, a new form of CP violation, da, 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 da. And I was like, wow, the only, the only person that made sense in terms of what, in, inform my theoretical musings later on was what you said mm. because the connection it got me thinking about the connection between cp violation right cpt symmetry and the violation of t but you're the one that came up with that an experimentalist mm -hmm. so i have very strong feelings about like you know how important it is for at least my students i'm like whatever opportunity you get you must be talking to experimentalists about your theory and 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 getting their feedback yeah because they have a kind of intuition that could be very useful for you. Yeah, my father, uh, who was a... You, in terms of giving you orientation and giving you direction, mm -hmm. otherwise you're going to be lost in like this jungle. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, my father, you know, was a, was a great mathematician. <clears throat> and he always used to say that actually you, me, I should know, you know, understand theoretical physics at the level comparable to a theoretician, uh, not necessarily at the level that I have to create new theories, although I've tried to do that mm -hmm. unsuccessfully uh, so far, but I'll let you know if that pans out. Join uh, the club. Join yeah, the club. exactly. Uh, you know, Mark Kamenkowski yeah. at Johns Hopkins, you know, used to call me a deeply closeted theorist, but, mm -hmm. but anyway, the, uh, the thing that I, you know, always took away from my father's statement and this is coming from a mathematician was that, to really, un to be a good experimentalist, you have to understand why you're doing it. You can't just be a plumber, you know, electrician, and, and, you know, those are great things to be, but in the context of truly understanding why you're doing it, and it's an obligation that I think a, an experimentalist has to understand the theory, otherwise they are just mean, merely, you know, kind of turning screws and, and so forth. And not to, again, to denigrate that at all, uh, but, but on the same token, a theorist doesn't necessarily have to understand the ins and outs of the experiment, but if he or she does, uh, it's a superpower. And I think that level, you know, when you see people like that, that are intimately embedded in experimental science, uh, something like our friend, David Spurgle, yes. uh, he, know, I mean, he could have been a great experimentalist. I mean, he understands the, you know, he, and he does numerical experiments, but he's uh, one of the foremost theorists of, of mm -hmm. his uh, generation. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, people like him or Robert Dickey, you know, also an eminent theorist, you know, Brand's Dickey theory, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, anthropic principle, he had precursor notion of inflation, flatness problems and so forth. And, and then he was, you know, deeply involved with experimental searches for, you know, gravity and uh, obviously the cosmic microwave background um, that, uh, you know, he's indelibly associated with. So, uh, I always say, and I, and I like to bring this up, I had this conversation with Stephen Wolfram and Jan Levin and Eric Weinstein, and it really revolves around what I think is physicists in general. So here we can agree that we're both physicists, but that we kind of envy in a certain sense the fact that mathematics, it can be proven that mathematics is either incomplete or incoherent in a sense. Gödel's theorem basically shows that. And the closest I argue that we have to such a dictum in physics is uh, Karl Popper's falsifiability criterion that's really called the demarcation that mm -hmm. something which cannot be proven wrong is does not yeah. constitute science. And that's, you know, no one made Popper God. Right? I mean, uh, just because he, and he had, you know, he had his predilections. He was a big believer in the steady state theory uh, for a long time. And because uh, he thought that was sort of Occam's razor, in a sense, explanation. So I wonder, you know, do you think that physicists will ever have something that really is elevated to the level of a girdle incompleteness theorem? Or is it, is it just destined to uh, really be some combination of Occam's razor and, and Karl Popper's demarcation hypothesis? Yeah, I think I mean you. I think you're asking the question of the ages. <laughs> I mean, that's a. I don't have. I would say that the closest I've come to, 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 to so I've, I've I've asked similar questions, and I ask it these days because some of the things that I'm working on, or even the new research research directions that I might be taking, um, you know, is really I think is is inspired um, by that challenge actually that you just ra raised. Mm. Uh, I want to read you a quote that I that think that that helps couch that 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 those questions actually yeah and gives me some some kind of direction or inspiration or solace um um to kind of maybe humble me and it's from albert einstein so mm. like in, in i think it was the 30s at, he was at oxford university and people were still trying to figure out how did you crack the code how did you figure it out how did you come up with general relativity like you know like how did you get that insight that space is right. cool? the tensorial field equations right and this was his response you know, and he's obviously speaking in a little bit of parables, right? So he goes, I'm quoting here, a new idea comes suddenly and in a rather intuitive way. That means it is not reached by conscious logical conclusions. But thinking it through afterwards, you can always discover the reasons which have led you unconsciously to your guess. And you will find a logical way to justify it. Mm. Albert Einstein. Mm. Very interesting. Oh, it's like, you know, you have this, into, you know, whatever, he had this... I mean, you, I'm just curious how, how, how you think that, 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 you know, by me, um, sidestepping to Albert Einstein has, um, 
Yeah, well, yeah, that's the last refuge of the scoundrel is to invoke Albert Einstein. But, um, you know, uh, yeah, I've had that exact same kind of thought that, you know, and don't forget, Einstein, you know, worked in a patent office. It's no secret, right? He was deeply influenced by, you know, Swiss uh, kind of, uh, you know, his Swiss heritage or, or up, you know, at least formative years there and at ETH and in, in, in Switzerland and, and seeing their culture of timekeeping and precision uh, that was really manifest at that time. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, never forget the, the kind of deep realizations he had. What did he call his deepest tool, his most important tool? He called them thought experiments, Gedanken experiments, right? So he was an experimentalist. It was just a, a thought experiment. And I wonder if nowadays you feel like we're kind of lost in math as our mutual friend, Sabine Hassenfelder, who'll be a guest on the show not too long from now, um, how she, you know, really makes this claim that theoretical physics has been, you know, basically stagnated for the last, uh, what does she call it? Basically our whole lifetime since the seventies. Um, and she claims that, you know, really the stagnation is the result of uh, really a fascination with the with an obsession with beauty and with with finding mathematics, uh, you know, to be elegant and beautiful, and and there have been books, you know, uh, Brian Greene, the actual name, the Elegant Universe. Uh, mm -hmm. Your book makes a lot of parallels between not visual arts, but but um, but you know, the uh, musical arts, jazz. Obviously, it's a huge part of it, and she claims that this, you know, is kind of treading over ground that hasn't borne fruit in 40 years so let, let me let me get your take on this and eric weinstein our mutual friend also mm -hmm. has had made significant claims of that nature on this very podcast and elsewhere that we're either very bad salesmen and saleswomen and that we're not really promoting how awesome theoretical physics has been or there really hasn't been the greatest turnover in new ideas since the you know november 1975 uh, kind of rep particle revolution where do you stand in that, uh, in that kind of... Yeah, yeah, no, it's a very... You're asking all these hard questions. I, yeah, I, well, what do you expect? I'm coming on this podcast. That's I'm why just, I'm paying you so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's your honorarium, brother. That's right. Hook me up. Um, um, so I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting tension. I mean, because at one level, so far, like, you know, when we look at our standard model of particle physics, right? Here we have this, this Lagrangian and you specify, like, you know, so my, one of my me great mentors, John Collins, particle physicist, um, John Collins, he said he had a final exam question for his, part, his quantum field theory, um, advanced quantum field theory class. And the question was, if I give you Lorentz invariance, um, SU2, SU3, and U1 and um, gauge invariance and four dimensions, there's only one unique Lagrangian to write down, write the Lagrangian down, right? And it's a standard model, you know, without, without the Higgs term and that kind of stuff, right? You can uniquely specify a theory that, like, you know, that we've just, you know, tested, you know, to, you know, great, great lengths, right? I mean, so, so at one level, you know, we see a posteriori, at least, you know, the incredible, what's that Vigna quote? The, um, the efficiency. Unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and yeah. physics. So I think that, that, that statement kind of codifies it. However... It reminds me of um, one, a great jazz musician, Ornit Coleman, who's, he's, who was also a mentor and a friend of mine. And I once bought um, a great, you know, a great musical re a researcher in cognitive science, Ani Patel, from, to come down to meet Ornit Coleman. And he had all these questions for Ornette, you know, all these technical questions about music theory and homiletics and all this stuff. And he goes to Ornette with these questions and Ornette goes, I'll answer if you can tell me where an idea comes from, right? And it was like, okay, maybe it was a cop out, but you know, yeah. the, well taken. And I think this points back to the Albert Einstein thing. Yeah, you know, we have this beautiful math that we can then use as a tool, and it can be very efficiently used to make predictions and calculate outcomes that another language may may not be able to do. Um, but you know, can you write down an, an equation for, in, for the intuition that got you that, that insight, that got you that math, mm. um, you know, and the source of the creativity or, you know, just basically physical, what about, what about physical intuition? Mm. What about the fact that, you know, you and I know we have, um, I mean, like David, like David is that, David Spurgle is like mm -hmm. that, right? You know, like David would have like a crazy intuition. He, he, he once told me something, uh, you know, um, three years prior was like an intuitive thing. 
-hmm. went back and I did the calculation for like two years and he was bang on correct. How mm -hmm. do you explain that? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so right. that the dance. There's this interesting thing there, right? And it goes back to this other thing about what Einstein said, you know, it, it, which is like the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it, it's, it's at all comprehensible. You know, what is, what is it about the human mind and us that's able to come up with this stuff? Mm. What's the math? What's the physics of that? You know? Yeah. Um, and like, so anyway, I, I, I think that it's a dance. It's sort of like, yes, nobody takes away from the math. But, you know, you and I, your dad... Um, was a great mathematician, and he once told me a story that he used to, that he used to tell you, when um, which was if anybody you know like you know math is people will try to impress you with math, and but what's a number? <laughs> it's like this question, right? What's a number? Right. One time I was uh, in I was at, in some space with, with these uh, I was at the Institute of Advanced Study on sabbatical, and there were all these brilliant mathematicians. <laughs> And they'll give me a hard time making fun of me of like this, you know, you physicists, you stumble on something and we come to clean it up. And then I said to one of them, what's a number? <laughs> and then he completely got like, he could, did not know how to respond to that. <laughs> so like, anyway, so I can go on for days yeah. about that. I don't have an answer to your question, mm -hmm. um, but I do believe that it's sort of like, you know, the whole elephant thing, that one party elephant, yes, seems like mathematics is a good tool, but not all mathematics. It seems like a subset of the math can be useful. And a subset, you know, of the math is just useful to mathematicians. And, um, and some, of the, some of it is useful to, to economics and some of it is useful to machine learning. Mm -hmm. But to say that math is going to be the thing, the guidepost and the, 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 the holy grail, that will give us um, give us the breakthroughs in physics. That I disagree with. Right. I think Especially that when I, you when you look yeah. explicitly at at it for guidance uh, via uh, elegance, beauty. You know, obviously there are people on one extreme, like uh, like Paul Dirac and maybe Eric Weinstein, cleaves to that mold. That is, you know, Dirac used to say it's more important that your equations be beautiful, that your math is beautiful, than it be right. Um, obviously he was right and he actually made predictions about the physical world um, more often than he was wrong. But I wonder, was there a tension, you know, as you're writing this book, the fourth anniversary of which is now mm -hmm. upon us, the jazz of physics, and you're talking about the secret link between the structure of the universe. And I wonder if you could take us through, what was the inspiration? When did you realize, first of all, that you had to write a book that you, cause you used to say to me, like, don't write a book unless you cannot not write a book. Like basically, yeah. You got to have, and you encouraged me. You said you have the story. You connected me and the right people and the right, the right times. And, and I couldn't have done it without you, but really I was always nervous. Like, do I have enough of an idea? And when did you know unequivocally that you had a, you had this idea for this brilliant book that would go on to be a bestseller and influence both, you know, it's like sometimes people to do to try to do too much. You said multitasking is not your strong suit, but you try to do something for the jazz community and then they're going to say, well, you're not a real jazz musician. And then you try to do something in physics. Well, you dabble in jazz. So was that a fearful process for you? I mean, you already had tenure, right? But, mm -hmm. but how, how did you, how was it for you when you knew you had to write this book and what fears did you have to overcome and limitations, self-limitation did you have to overcome in order to bring it to life? Another, again, another card question. Well, yeah. well, you're, the, ones, man. you're, the, you're the Ivy League professor, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think like, you know, looking back at it, because sometimes you do things and you're not, you're not even aware of what the impulse was. So, um, but looking back, I realized I did, I wrote the book. I had to write the book for, t for mainly two reasons. The first reason was um, I wanted to write the book for a younger version of myself. So mm -hmm. in other words, when I was like some, you know, <laughs> some you know some young lost soul that may may have like had my fantasies you know my naive fantasies about about, about being a scientist and um especially physics and and you know being a musician and not not wanting to really give up on either and, and not knowing how to reconcile those um inner inner conflicts of, of, of identity actually of not actually it's it's also about that 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 nerd from the Bronx that mm -hmm. really didn't fit in and and like you know had this these two passions and couldn't find that outlet anywhere, either you're the cool musician or you're the nerdy scientist and I was I was sort of like in the closet about both of those things 
And I, I felt like, you know, I had reached a certain level of like, you know, you know, I kind of knew how to play my horn. I knew something about music um, and I knew something about physics. And I was like, start to see ways in which those two worlds um, were, were linked. And um, I just said, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to write this book. I have to write this book, but I have to write the book to clarify some of those things. So mm -hmm. it was actually a process of like, you have this, this sort of inner intuition and the process of writing the book and telling those stories helped me clarify and also reconcile some of those conflicts that I actually had. And it was a process of coming out of the closet as well and making it known to people who I was afraid of and I was afraid would judge me to say, you know what, this is who I am. And this is what, this is, this is the story. And, and, you know, you saw the book, some of the book reviews I got, some of them were not, some of them were people who were threatened by that. And they were like, no, you know, you're just a physicist trying to be a musician and you're, or you're just a fake physicist viewing music. I was like, maybe I'm neither of those things. How about that? You know, like, <laughs> right. you know, I am like writing the story. This is my, this is this narrative. And so, um, so for me, it was kind of both of those things. The process of trying to clarify something mm -hmm. by, by, by writing and telling those stories. And then, and also, you know, kind of like writing that book for, for a kid, for a young person, or a person, you know, that writing a book for somebody that, that would find a, such a book very useful or, or inspirational. Yeah, and I think it has. I mean, you were able to communicate to people. I remember you telling me, uh, you know, wait till you start getting, you know, emails from people <laughs> around the world. And, you know, and I've gotten that. I've gotten people, you know, some guy in Pakistan, uh, you know, who's, who's like, I'm your biggest fan. And, you know, he's probably Muslim. And here I am, this New York Jew, you know, and, and like we couldn't be farther apart. And, you know, I'll get emails about that. And it's, I think, a, a large part because you encouraged me that the story has to come out. If you don't let it I'm out. Glad you, did it. you know, I'm glad you did it. Why? It's funny. It, it, you, you're going to now see the blessings actually coming out soon because you have, you, you're also a pioneer because the very thing that you were, um, that you were, there's fear in this, as you know. Mm -hmm. I knew that when you were writing, one of, there was this fear, let's face it, of like, all right, I have to, I have to come out and say, you know, speak about my spirituality and, and the veracity of my science and, you know, in, in the same breath, in the same book. And I remember that there was, there, there was, you know, um, you know, what happens when you write books like this. And it turns out a book, it will soon be coming out that I'm actually, um, um, I'm re I have to take, I have to read by a very, very accomplished um, um, young physicist. I can't mention his name. I can't. Mm -hmm. And it touches on the similar topics. Mm. Like it touches on like, you know, this guy's actually a rabbi as mm. well as like a top notch theoretical um, biophysicist. Wow. Like he's talking about, and it's, so it's like, aren't you glad that you were the first to write such a book? <laughs> well, you know, you know the, now wants to sell himself as, as like, I'm writing the first book of this nature where I'm making this link in a way that's like, you cannot answer the question about this unless you look at this, which we're told to not look at. Right. Right. You did it already. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, uh, and again, you know, I don't want to turn this into too much of a mutual admiration society, but, but it's impossible. What happens to, when you bring your friends on your podcast? I know, I know. That's right. I'll, uh, I'll, the university will forbid me from bringing on buddies again. But the, uh, but the, but the basic oh, truth. Okay, it's time to get hardcore now. <laughs> that's right. Um, you know, for me, thinking about what a book is, and, and at the end of the podcast, we'll ask, you guys, we'll ask you the same questions I ask everybody that comes on, which is, you know, the meaning of books and how they affect you. And it's exactly like you're saying how it can be this this letter, almost as I call it in the book, like an ethical will, where you give a you you have a book and it's not really for you. I mean, we'll we'll talk about that later. What your legacy, what you hope your legacy will really um, amount to, and and in terms of your book, and and maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, about your next project. We'll talk about that at the very end. But uh, you know, one of the things that really spoke to me in this book is a notion of gratitude and the gratitude that you have for teachers. And as I, you know, I hope that there's nobody who speaks Russian out there um, in the in the wilderness listening. But the word, as I was taught by my teacher Alexander Polnarev, who you knew very well, and great Alexander Polnarev, yes, that's right, that's one a great the, physicist, right? He here, is, that. yeah. And having him as a mentor, you know, he used to say, "Scientist in Russian translates into a person who was taught." And, you know, in your book, you're talking about these things and you're talking about, at one point you referenced my, 
uh, your reference, Bruce Partridge, one of your teachers, and David Wilkinson, who is my grand advisor. So he's my PhD advisor, Peter Timby's PhD advisor. Mm-hmm. And in my book, I also show my, uh, my uh, academic genealogy stretching back to the 1500s. And now one of my students, Darcy Barron, is now she's a professor and now she has a graduate student at the oh, University of New Mexico. Yeah. So it's like 20 generations. And how do you see yourself and this book, you know, kind of in the in that along that chain that's unfurled since you know in here in the ancients going back to Pythagoras etc that you talk about all the way through the future the resonances of the universe how did that thesis play out did it come to you how did it the this inspiration we talked about how the story emerged from you the fears you overcame but where did this idea come from or is it like you know Einstein you just can't you can't really pin it down yeah, I mean, a lot of it came from actually listening, you know, I, as you know, I'm a big, I'm an avid fan of John Coltrane mm-hmm. and, and, um, and, you know, and listening to his, the evolution of his, his sound, his music, he kind of like, you know, went from sort of like the more traditional bebop, hard bop tradition. And then he kind of went into this other realm where it was more an exploration of sound. Um, so just not necessarily structured notes and chord changes and the way in which we, you know, might traditionally think about music, but, and, you know, culture is also like, you know, even in a love Supreme, um, or even like the more like, you know, in, in a, um, his album expression or, you know, um, cosmic sound, right. Interstellar space. That's a great album, by the way. Um, every, every, um, every song is named after a planet mm-hmm. in our solar system. And, and, and it's, it's fantastic. And, it's just a different axis that you know that you have to listen and but it's beautiful and it's capturing but it's an exploration of sound so then when i realized that actually you know music what we call music and also some of it also had to do with the inspiration i had from brian eno who is a friend and um, a mentor that i knew and i don't mean to name drop but i you know i can't help myself no i was actually just going to read his blurb this book could have just as well been called the joy of physics because what leaps out is stefan alexander's delight and curiosity about the cosmos and how he finds pleasure in exploring it brian eno artist composer and producer so that's right and so brian was also that kind of musician which mm-hmm. was that he played with sound he you know he basically was basically engineer um i guess he referred to himself you do treatments when he was at rock to music right and sound synthesis and the, you know just the science of sound and i was like well that's my hook i mean here we have you know sound and acoustics which is a branch of physics already so that's already a link mm. and then then there's this remarkable crazy thing which as you know to, when we look at the expanding universe jim peebles who won the nobel prize this year right uh, wait wait was it last year or this yeah. year no 2019 Right, Jim Peebles, and yep. there's a whole chapter in the book about Jim Peebles' discovery before he got the Nobel Prize. By yeah, the way, that's right. You predicted okay. it, and you know that prediction was that if the universe is expanding, this is what's crazy, right? If the universe is expanding, and only if the universe is expanding, the equation, the equation for the plasma. So you have the expanding universe, right, and it's filled with a plasma of hot, energetic electrons and photons. And it's all, you know, there's no structure there, but it's basically a medium that can carry sound. And what Peebles basically showed is that that system literally is an acoustic system and that the expansion rate itself set the scale for the resonance. So just like, you know, how we have an instrument and the, the geometric size of an instrument, right? The size, if I have a flute, if you did the, 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 the fundamental, the largest, the longest frequency that can fit, right, is basically the length divided by fourth of that flute, right? And a similar calculation, what people showed is that you're going to get these sound waves, mm. and these sound waves are responsible for seed and structure, stars and galaxies and us. And it started with sound. And of course, there's a beautiful resonance with the book of Genesis as well. Mm-hmm. You know? Instead of in the beginning was a word, in the beginning was sound. Mm right the begin of our structure and so like that to me was just so compelling just like you know that the modern jazz musicians and modern um composers like brian you know like their their direction and their music was more about sound and then you had like this fundamental thing happening in cosmology that the big question that we ask and the thing i was researching which is structure formation in the universe and that also had to do with sound and that to me was my link 
And then once I had that link, it, then it became now, how far can I push these analogies? And the book was also a book about analogies. It was a book about the importance when we do scientific research and scientific inquiry, the importance of not getting it exact and not having an exact mathematical equation, but having a good analogy between mm -hmm. two systems that actually are just analogous to each other. And then where they don't completely overlap, it might give you a new direction for, you know, for your investigation to discover something new. Mm. So, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. So when I was talking with Eric Weinstein a couple of weeks ago, one of my listeners asked me to ask him a question about, you know, uh, he said, basically, I've heard Eric describe geometric unity, which is his new theory or not new, but his proposal for at least one venue to pursue that may ultimately lead some to some greater unification of, of the laws of physics and gravity as well with the uh, three other uh, four of the four forces of nature. And this gentleman friend of mine said, uh, I've listened to him on Joe Rogan's show uh, a couple times. I've listened to him on Lex Friedman's show. Uh, and I just don't get it. The way he explains things, I do not get it. So please ask him to describe it in terms of analogies. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and I don't know if I succeeded so much in my interview with him, but uh, the listeners can be the judge of that. Uh, but, but that's one of the most beautiful aspects of your book is is that you are thinking in analogies and like again i'm not you know you know me but when when i give you a compliment you gotta look out but uh, <laughs> uh but you know I'm, the, I'm your friendly neighborhood grouchy cosmologist right uh as you put it at my wet and your wedding speech at my wedding uh but the I'm but the top heads off yes <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is you know having this ability to analogize i hate it when people say can you dumb it down you know because no you can't dumb it down. And if you do, and, and you told me this again, another piece of sage advice of the book, don't dumb it down. Don't dumb down your research. Don't dumb down your physics because what's important is that you, the reader feels like you respect him or her. And if you respect him or her, then she's likely to feel trusted and, and, and trust you uh, and that you're taking uh, him or her seriously. So I thank you for that. And the analogies play really well. And the criticism, you know, I always say, I think it'll be a fun podcast. Tell me what you think about this. You know, like, I think it'll be fun to have a podcast where you have people who are, um, who are verified purchasers and they've mm -hmm. read your book, my book, you know, whoever's book, and they gave it a one star review and they're, but they're not like just trolls who are being nasty, you know, but yeah. like when people criticize your book, they say things like, well, you know, it's not really, you know, how does the universe improvise? And that's not really the point of that you're trying no. to make. You're making an analogy and it's not I'm like you're saying, saying let's revive Pythagoras. Yeah, Go no. on. Yeah. Go I'm on. Not saying, that's right. I'm not saying that a lot of people mistook. They were like, when they bought the book, they had these high hopes of thinking, Oh, the universe reveal that the universe is a jazz. You know, there's a jazz musician playing the universe. Yeah. And the universe is improvising that kind of stuff. Um, that's not, yeah, I wasn't trying to No, say, it's very clear. Uh, that subtitle is The Secret Link. Okay, so I can see people getting a little woo-woo about The Secret yeah. Link. But between the music yeah, and, the books, and the structure of the universe, you're yeah. talking about the structure. That means the large-scale structure, the organization yeah. of the structure, which on large scales, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. the large-scale properties of the universe may in turn be determined by its microstructure. Can you talk a little bit about that and how mm -hmm. the very tiny can affect the very large? Yeah, I mean, uh, if we're, if you allow me to, I mean, to talk about inflation and the quantum yeah. fluctuations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. I mean, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, um, again, in like, if you look at people like Brian Eno and, you know, people that work in electronic synthesis where you, you know, you, um, you, you play with sound, you know, you manipulate sound waves electronically, right? Um, to create new sounds and actually, you know, create entire compositions, for example. Mm -hmm. um, generative music is an example of this. And actually, if you look at, um, as an analogy, so you, want, so you want to explain cosmic inflation and the quantum field theoretic fluctuations of inflation, good luck to a lay reader, right? <laughs> but here I have, you know, I can, I can, you know, talk about a synthesizer and I can talk about, you know, that, you know, every note is like basically a sine wave and, I, and it turns out that when I use that analogy, it comes really, really close. Mm -hmm. The universe is not a synthesizer, mm -hmm. but you can really understand a lot of, of cosmic, of, like, of the fact that, what, that during inflation, the early stages of the universe, right? Um, 
you know, um, you know, 10 to the minus, you know, 30 something seconds, right? Um, after the Big Bang, you have basically um, a, 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 a period of rapid expansion in the universe. And that rapid expansion of the space, space time of the, um, basically sets the stage such that it amplifies um, these quantum undulations. It amplifies them and stretches them. Mm. And those are the things, and it does it in a way where it's very democratic in how mm. it does it. So it creates basically something that we call white noise. Mm -hmm. And everybody here is white, knows what white noise sounds like. It's basically the hiss mm. that you hear if you, had, if you had old school TV sets. Um, but the basic point there is that, you know, um, that initial sound, that initial sound spectrum, um, it's not literally sound, it's the sound of the vacuum, if you want to call it, um, is, you know, is the thing that we, you know, I think the current paradigm is, and it's consistent with the experiments, is the thing that source the large scale structure in our universe today. Um, but, you know, going back that I can explain a lot of that not by saying that the universe is, you know, playing a jazz chord. It isn't. Mm -hmm. But it's a re it's really impressive analogy. And, you know, I, you know who I learned this from, actually? I think who did it the best was um, Richard Feynman. Mm. And, and it's because, you know, I felt like to really make these analogies and do it well, you actually really had to understand the, you know, the, the subject matter deeply. It's really hard to, make, to find a good analogy for something unless you have a... Well, you could get lucky and you could have a good intuition. I'm not saying it's the only way, but I found it was the exercise of finding these analogies really required me to like, to understand the, you know, you know, quantum fluctuations a lot deeper than I thought I'd understood it just by writing down the, the you know, the creation and annihilation operators, you know? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. And alienating your authors. I mean, I think, you know, Stephen Hawking said every equation Cuts Let me ask you that's one thing. Yeah. I also believe that mathematics is also an analogy. Yeah. You know, if you have like a, you know, like if I look at a pendulum and it's going up and down, I write down, you know, a simple harmonic, you know, I write down the oscillator equation for that. That's just an analogy. Okay? Yeah. It's Why else would Wigner say it's unreasonable? Relation to the real thing. Right. Why else would Wigner say it's unreasonable for math to be effective unless it is only an analogy, right? It's a model for, it's not the thing. If we can't understand what a number is or, you know, it takes two books of, of proofs to, to show that one plus one equals two. So two is an only at best imperfect approach asymptotically to the notion of, of what meaning is uh, in terms of a mathematical description of physics. And Galileo, you know, was one of the first, if, uh, you know, to, to really in, invoke that. And I think, you know, this book pays homage to that. that. And, yeah. So he was the first, you know, he was a mathematician. His father thought he should be a doctor. Uh, you know, his father was a musician and uh, wanted his son to not, you know, squander his talents and, and uh, become a physician. <laughs> And so he didn't, he became a doctor, but you know, not the kind that helps people like us. Uh, he became like us uh, instead. Well, I want to ask you, uh, and I know you don't have too much more time, but I want to start, um, you know, kind of winding down this particular episode. We're going to do many more parts, I hope. Um, mm -hmm. Can you say anything about projects that you're working on in the future before we get to uh, the, the, the segment that I call the final five, which I ask all my guests, but in particular in research, in jazz, in writing, can you take us on those three, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. kind of tr trimesters or uh, try tri segments of your brain? And uh, where are you? Uh, what, what are your plans in each one of those three different uh, areas? Well, you know, actually, before I left, Leon, Leon, was, Leon Cooper was my first thesis advisor. Um, and then mm -hmm. I moved into cosmology. And what happened, it's in my book, but it started off with, with back then, Leon was doing uh, machine learning, like, but basically modeling real process. He became a biophysicist soon after yeah. his Nobel Prize. And I was working on in the early days of machine learning with Leon. Um, and I, it, the, I, the project back then that I was working on was to, to look at the large scale structure of the universe using unsupervised um, um, neural networks. Oh, learn. yeah. I remember that. And I wrote that. I even I still have that paper I wrote in 1997. It was like a preprint that I never put out. Right. It's really funny to see that that's what people are working on today. Um, but I've, I've returned back to some of that, um, but more at a theoretical level, trying to understand, you know, what is it about the, these, the architectures and what is this, you know, it, it, it turns out there there's certain physical systems, like may, I don't want to give, give too much of it away, mm -hmm. that 
has a really close semblance to the way the machine learning architectures are modeled mathematically and looking at these physical models and that and trying to understand whether or not what what can be gained um, on both sides of that analogy. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I'm working on is I've been Leon after Leon told me to find a real project to work on. Mm -hmm. I decided to dedicate a lot of my after tenure. So the last like, I don't know, 12 years, I've been working on the cosmological constant problem. Yep. And I'm starting to make some, um, some progress on that. You know, that's led to this whole thing about the multiverse and that, you know, if the cosmological constant, the vacuum energy is exactly not this value, you can't have life in the universe. Right. That's not actually exactly true. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's a paper I wrote with, um, with um, Fred Adams and Gro and um, Mercini Houghton. We showed that if you let other coupling constants um, float as well, you can, you, can, you can change the vacuum energy by eight orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude, I forget, and you still get habitable zones. So it's not as finely tuned as we're led to believe. Yeah, and that, that then gave me the, 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 the um, confidence to then really start, Leon gave me an idea. He said, there is a hidden symmetry at work, and it's not supersymmetry that is dealing with the cosmological constant. And I think I found what that is, and I've been mm. working on that. And it's related to our good friend, our you know our friend and your 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 um, <laughs> benefactor and and um, um, Jim Simons. Um, mm -hmm. It's related to Chern Simons actually. Um, wow. So I put a preprint out recently. It's up for review. It looks like it's going to get published, and it's a way of um, dealing with the vacuum energy, sequestering it into a topological sector, having to do with the Chern Simons number. And what we're looking at now, uh, if we have we have this theory, it's a modified theory of gravity. And we're looking right now to look to see if there's solar system tests that can constrain this theory. So again, experiment, you know, whether or not there, this thing makes a, a pr prediction that deviates from Einstein's relativity and, you know, either it makes a prediction and if it, if it, whatever that is, can we rule the theory out? You know, that, so that's kind of what I'm doing physics wise these days. Other than that, I'm pretty, I'm pretty confused and, and, um, and, and, and directionless. I'm, I'm, I'm still also trying to find what directions to go into. So maybe you can, um, offline, you and I can talk about some of the secret experiments you're doing. Yeah, um, well, we're, we, uh, it's funny because, you know, um, well, Max Planck said that physics advances one funeral at a time. But it was funny because I, I sort of mean, I mean it in a non-morbid sense by, uh, you know, kind of one paper at a time, every, every generation, you have to reinvent all the literature. So one of my students is working on looking at axions and time-varying signals, mm. how they could be produced in the CMB polarization or, or discovered through CMB polarization. Mm. And then our mutual collaborator in uh, Tel Aviv University, Mayor Shimon, mm. brought up that you had worked on a similar effect, you know, but with circular polarization. And so my my graduate student, you know, now we're in like the second, almost third generation <laughs> between all three of us. And, uh, and we're looking at, you know, how can we constrain, you know, circular biofringence and uh, circular dichroism and things like exotic effects, mm -hmm. all in an effort to really understand how did, uh, you know, how do these, how can we constrain such exotic uh, phenomena that may lead Very to... Exotic violation mm -hmm. of the most sacrosanct laws of physics, Lorentz mm -hmm. invariance, time reversal, CPT violation, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, uh, yeah. So even though we, uh, we don't get to, you know, hang out under the Waterman street bridge and, and uh, drink oceans coffee very often, uh, we're going to do that soon. Any, uh, what about like, obviously COVID is, uh, has put a crimp on a lot of your performances, but, yeah. uh, you were very uh, active in the, in the Providence and Boston, New York jazz scene, any long, long range plans or, or things yeah. on the horizon once things return to normal or not yet? Yeah. So there's a film. So there's this, um, project. So um, I've been working with this, um, this great basis, um, you know, uh, considered to be the uh, jazz times basis of the year, Melvin Gibbs, hmm. um, Played jazz, played, he was the basis of the Rollins band. I mean, so Melvin, JT Lewis, um, the, the great drummer JT Lewis, and DJ Logic. Um, we recently did um, a live um, street, of like a, a, a block, like sort of like performance mm -hmm. of, of, of social distance and yeah. what music looks like when you, when you social distance. And that will be released very soon. This um, great filmmaker, Cam. Kristen, I'm, I'm mispronouncing his name. So he's putting out a series um, soon and we will appear in that. But no, I have not been playing out a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've 
mainly been just trying to get, you know, practice when I can. Um, hopefully I'll emerge, you know, like, like, you know, Sonny Rollins in the bridge, right? You know, I, I'll emerge from the bridge, you know, being able to play Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star a little bit better. Yeah, a little bit better, yeah. My kids will uh, appreciate Uncle Stefan uh, performing even even I'm more frequently than... Pumpkin, part two. That's right, Great Pumpkin. Uh, last thing is you're in the visual arts before we turn to the final uh, segment here. Um, so you played a role in the film uh, Wrinkle in Time. Can you talk a little bit about that and... Uh, oh, what the yeah. if there's anything uh, coming up in that in that aspect of Stefan's no brain. no um, so um, that was great fun I learned a lot from that um, I, actually the thing that was interesting there was that you know like I work with their creative team and like you know they're all about like you know you need to you, you need to take psychedelics to really be you know to see no quantum burst and I'm like I'm okay you know no, no, no. I don't need that. Is that I actually in working on that film and like you know um, a wrinkle in time and trying to figure out how to build a test rack and how to do it in a way that's not a corny wormhole anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know, all this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. That tired of wormholes. Wormholes peak, we're at peak wormhole. Right. Exactly, like, you know, enough wormholes, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, and one of the things I learned, I actually, you know, it was interesting. I learned things about my physics, trying to explain physics to them, right? Yeah. Um, and um, so, no, so the answer is, no. However, as you know, I am the president of a, you know, a, an organization of um, black scientists, mm -hmm. um, the National Society of Black Physicists. And one of the things that I dream of doing, you know, um, and we're trying to do is to create new platforms for our young emerging scientists. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think like some of those platforms may start looking like, you know, having people kind of like in a very exciting and natural and, you know, organic way talk about their science, talk about their lives and uh, have interesting conversations. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think that working with, you know, the great Ava DuVernay, right. And her creative team for Wrinkling Time uh, gave me some ideas of how to do that. And actually, you know, I, I'll, I'll say my last compliment to you, um, you know, listening to preacher Brian, like, you know, give his sermons, you know, definitely, um, you know, um, Giving me some uh, um, other tips as well. <laughs> All right, good enough. Well, uh, I, I will say though that there was there was an idea that I, I felt I got ripped off on, and I, I can't. Yeah. For, for reasons I can't. Oh come on! Say. You can't you can't tease like that. No, because I, I don't know, man. You know, you might have to like snip it out later on. Uh -oh, uh -oh. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. But there was we'll a famous movie where they use a concept for time travel, and that was my idea. Okay. Oh that's wow. Cool. Okay. All right. I'm not, we will talk offline about that. We'll get our, I have a phalanx of lawyers in the next room. I can, I can call right, in, right. you know? Yeah. Um, well, thank yeah. you for calling me a preacher. I haven't, you know, been uh, associated with the Catholic Christian church in a long time, but, but it's nice to always go back to my roots there. Um, <laughs> so the end of the talk, I usually uh, like to bring up, I call it uh, the final five and I, I like to bring together some themes across all the great intellects that I am uh, privileged and blessed to interview, such as yourself. And uh, it's been, you know, it's been, it's been kind of a, a, a wonderful time in the last few months being with my children, with my wife, et cetera, but it's been challenging. And, and part of the way to get out of the depression you know, that's natural to feel on occasion is to engage with great minds and great books. And I thought back as I was interviewing um, Sasha Sagan, who's the daughter of, Carl Sagan and Andrurian, who's an amazing um, you know, kind of more artistic and, and not as obviously as scientifically astute as, as Carl Sagan, but nevertheless has made so many contributions to culture and popularization of science. So when I interviewed uh, Sasha, I brought up the fact that her father said in an episode of the original Cosmos um, a series in 1980s, there was an episode called The Persistence of Memory. So I'm going to read it like him. What an astonishing thing a book is. It is a flat object made from a tree with flexible parts mm -hmm. on which are imprinted lots of funny, dark squiggles and, and equations and, and graphs and, and all sorts of cool goodness in this book. Um, but one glance at it and you're inside the mind of another person, maybe somebody dead for thousands mm -hmm. of years. Mm, never thought about this. Way, yeah. Across the millennia, an mm -hmm. author is speaking clearly and silently inside of your head directly to you. And I think it's, uh, he says, uh, a book is proof that humans are capable of working magic. 
What I want to ask you is he talked about, you know, millennia ago, a book could have been written that influenced you. Um, obviously, you're studied in the arts of, of, uh, of you know, Pythagoras, et cetera, and, and you look at the ancient scrolls and, and its original parchment and uh, papyrus. But uh, I want to talk about that magical aspect of books and whether or not you, Stefan, Alexander, mm. high professor of, uh, high Solomon professor of, of, of uh, physics at Brown University. If you had your choice, you can only choose one. Don't say both. I'll, I'll get you if you do. But would you rather have 100 readers of your book, The Jazz of Physics, next year, or one reader 100 years from now? Um, one reader 100 years from now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyone uh, want to elaborate on that? No, because I think this idea of it, um, I mean, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about like a book I read recently um, that, that, you know, I think the book was written maybe in the forties. So it's not quite a hundred years ago, but just again, like this, it was, it was that much more special that it was written at that time. It was a different time, you know, a different time um, in our century. Um, and it was Schrodinger's What is Life? Yeah. I remember you, t you, you gave that to me in uh, second year grad school. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. oh, I never returned it. I never returned it. So that's where your copy yeah, okay, was. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just worth now. <laughs> <laughs> Signed by Schrodinger. Exactly. One million dollars. Wow. Okay? Uh, but um, yeah, so I, but I think like, you know, you know, reading that book and just knowing, actually just knowing that Schrodinger wrote that book back then mm. has, this, you know, it does have this impact. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Okay, next question that I ask uh, again about readers of your book, The Jazz of Physics, now in its fifth year. It's uh, finished uh, four years of or four orbits around the sun with this mm -hmm. wonderful, uh, wonderful book on it. Uh, what do you have as a preference for readers? Now, this again is not a hater, troll, uh, you know, someone who's flaky or just doesn't like stuff on. This is somebody who's engaged with the book, read it cover to cover, maybe twice. Uh, would you rather have someone who's skeptical of the notions that there is a secret link between physics and the structure of the cosmos? Or would you rather have it be a fanboy, a fangirl that just loves the ideas, just like really into it? Who would you rather have? really deeply, thoroughly, meaningfully engage with your book? Someone who's skeptical. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Because I'm skeptical about that too. Yeah. No, I think that's the most honest yeah. way that a scientist can be about, uh, certainly about his or her work in, in, in science. Remember, Feynman said, you know, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. So we sort of should be adversarial with each other's scientific ideas. Absolutely. But a book like ours that, you know, might be a polemic. Um, yeah. So it's great to hear your, uh, your feelings there. Okay. I've always seen you as this ebullient optimist. Um, what are you pessimistic about? Anything to do with the future of education post COVID? Um, anything that you're pessimistic about? Okay, so I'm a contrarian, as you know. So what are you pessimistic yeah. about as an optimist? Good. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I am. Yeah, I don't know if the word. If, if, I don't know how to how to word it, but like you know, but it's sort of like I know there's a faint, there's another Einstein quote, and he goes, you know, that. We have a one Einstein quote per episode minimum, uh, maximum. Okay. Sorry, well, no, I'm just kidding. Einstein didn't say it. Uh, <laughs> his brother said it. Um, Weinstein. Weinstein said it. Weinstein said this, yeah. Um, actually, I think Weinstein actually did say this quote. <laughs> I'm sure he there did. Two things, in the, in the, in two things that are infinite. The universe and um, human stupidity. Mm -hmm. and, and then I think Einstein goes on to say, I'm not certain about the universe, though. <laughs> But it's, and again, like, you know, when I say that, I'm also including myself in this. I'm also including my stupidity as well. I am, I am part of that human family. And I think this uncanny ability for us to just, you know, sometimes, you know, make stupid choices and do stupid things when they are clear, um, the clear smart thing to do. And it's, it's in front of us and we choose to make a stupid choice. And I think that there are certain things, I'm being now very general, but now let me make it specific. I think that, you know, I hope that in this next, the next hour, this sort of new generation of, of thinkers and scientists and people who are gonna do competent things and brave things, mm -hmm. that they are truly rewarded for, for their innovations and not held back because they may be different and they may think different or look different or talk different, right? And they don't fit into the you know, social structures or what have you that they're going to be rewarded for their innovations because we have 
I, I'm, I'm seeing, especially here at Brown, I'm seeing a new generation of truly brilliant young people that are just different. Mm. And we have to be ready for them. We have mm. to be, and also be ready to, to elevate them and, and you know, give platforms to them and protect them. And at the same time, and teach them at the same time, but definitely acknowledge them and, 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 um, and reward them, even if they're different. And, you know, and, and I'm also referring to like things like, you know, when um, people from underrepresented groups and women in, in the sciences um, who are thinking, might be thinking differently and coming up with innovations that we should, um, as a community, um, really um, make the smart choices by, um, celebrating their innovations yeah yeah well that really pains me to admit how beautifully eloquent that was said about i learned it all from you bro yeah i don't know about that (laughs) um (laughs) all right last question revolves around the telescope um so uh saron kierkegaard as you know uh once said that life can only be understood backwards but you must live it forwards. And, you know, we astronomers look through telescopes and we see things at great distances that were uh, only produced very long ago. And so we might have clarity about what that system used to look like. We have no idea what it looked like now. But what I'm asking you now really refers to the name of this podcast, which is one of uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke's three laws. So one of his laws was the only, uh, <clears throat> the oh, I'll say the first one is uh, um, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That was his first law. Uh, his second law, I'll just quote the second, third one second, but his second law was for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. Uh, but the third law is where we get the name of this podcast from. And he said, the only way to find out what is possible is to venture beyond a little bit into the impossible. So uh, as the you know, co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, I want to ask you, looking back through Kierkegaard's telescope, um, mm-hmm. what things seemed impossible to you as a 20-year-old, as a 30-year-old, um, that now seem possible because you have that courage to venture into the impossible? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I thought the thing that was impossible that, I mean, I never... <laughs> I was I was so um, I was so convinced that I wasn't going to make it as a as a scientist as a physicist in terms of being able to have a career and a profession, let let alone tenure and what have you, um, that I just went along with for the ride, just expecting you know well this year I'm not going to make it and this year I'm not going to make it, and I so I, it never was like I have to make it and get tenure and do this and do that right it was more like mm-hmm. you know I, I'm going to continue doing this as long as I I'm allowed to and then. When I fall off the cliff, I'll just, you know, do something else, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so at, at that 20-year-old person, I, I thought it was impossible that I was going to make it to where I'm at right now professionally. Mm-hmm. And another thing was, as a theorist, and, I, 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 and this still lives with me, I think the dream of a, of a theorist, for me, of this theorist, is to actually have a, a, be part of a theory or be part of a, an idea mm. that actually finds, it, finds a home in an experiment that actually mm. manifests itself to be correct. Um, it says something about the real world, our world, right? Because um, uh, all of us, all theorists were wrong, okay? Everything we publish, unless it's experimentally confirmed, okay, it, it meets a certain theoretical standard. But, but it's it tentative. The gold standard of actually it being, you know, um, the detection of, well, you know, the, all, the, all the things that um, were experimentally confirmed um, that had been predicted, the Higgs boson that Jerry Groundlick played a big role in, right? When mm-hmm. we were grad students. That's right. Our professor, um, yeah. So, yeah. So the point is that like that to me is still, still feels impossible, mm-hmm. but it feels possible so long as I'm not, so long as I continue kind of keeping it humble and talking and actually, uh, you know, and, and, and continuing to talk to, to, to experimentalists. Cause mm-hmm. I think that you guys kind of hold, give us the orientation and the direction and the intuition sometimes to, to not get lost in that jungle. Well, that's really phenomenal. Well, Stefan, uh, I want to thank you uh, again. I owe you another coffee someday. I'll buy it from Ocean's Coffee Roasters. You can just buy my own coffee um, estate. And- <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, yeah, well, I'll put in a requisition for that. Sure uh, I want to thank you. We'll put in your website, your Twitter handle. We'll add all that in. I uh, just want to thank you for your generosity of, uh, of spirit, your honesty, 
uh, vulnerability, and also your insights. And I want to also recognize you as the uh, as the leader, as the president of the National Society for Black Physicists, which uh, which I am honored to be an honorary member of, to be redundant. And I'm looking forward to many big things that we can do together to advance the you know story tradition of this wonderful entity that you're that you're uh, charged with being an intrepid leader of. So I want to thank you for your service to physics, to the community, uh, to all of us, really. And we, we have a great uh, debt to you. And I cannot wait to see what you come up with next in your indomitable, improvisational, um, epicurean. No, uh, I'll stop with the superlatives here because, uh, you know, otherwise you'll get a big head. Thank all you right. so much, Stefan Alexander. Uh, Thank you uh, again for sharing your time. Thank you, Mr. Brian Keaton, Dr. Brian Keaton. <laughs> and um, I look forward to seeing you soon. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If you enjoyed this episode of Into the Impossible, please subscribe, comment, share, rate, and review. For a chance to win a free copy of our most recent guest's newest book, send a screenshot of your review to info at imagine.ucsd.edu. We appreciate hearing from you and are always open to your suggestions for future episodes. For more information, go to imagination.ucsd.edu. Find us on Twitter at ImagineUCSD. Watch us on YouTube. Listen on iTunes. Into the Impossible is a production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination in the Division of Physical Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. Eric Veery, Director. Brian Keating, Co-Director. Patrick Coleman, Associate Director. Produced by Stuart Valko.